So we're going to start off uh, with Dr. Mark Kramer from the University of Louvain. Uh, Mark is a world authority on COPD, as like everybody in the program today. He's recently uh, transformed himself into a researcher, into an administrator, executive of a large healthcare complex. But uh, he still retains a strong interest in COPD, and Mark and I collaborate with Gene and Gold. So it's a real pleasure, Mark, to introduce you to present on the topic, Burden of COPD and its Implications. Thank you. I will try to show you some ideas and work that we developed uh, a few years ago when I was president of ERS together with the Brussels office and that was subsequently taken on by the ERS uh, further. So for me it's a great pleasure to be here in honor of Jim Hawk and I think I've known Jim for a very long period of time. He's an outstanding scientist, but above all, he's an outstanding person. I mean, in academic medicine, you come across all sorts of people, but you rarely come across somebody who is as nice as Jim is. This is my disclosure. Uh, I'm not allowed to do these things anymore in my new position, so when I come back next year, I have a blank slide for this. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll tell you a little bit about NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Um, these sort of encompass diseases like heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, cancer, respiratory and liver disease. And they affect one third of the population of Europe, which is about 100 million citizens. 86% of the deaths in the WHO Europe, Europe region are due to these diseases. And 28% of the disability adjusted life years are attributable to risk factors common to these chronic diseases. And this now will become a formidable problem in the next years. It is so important that the United Nations in September 2011 organized a meeting on a medical subject. Uh, that may not tell you much, but it was only the second time that that happened in the history of the United Nations. Nations. The first time was the beginning of the 90s at the time of the AIDS epidemic. So chronic respiratory diseases are part of these uh, NCDs and there are five major chronic respiratory diseases, COPD, asthma, lung cancer, pneumonia and tuberculosis. They are responsible for 15 to 20 percent of all deaths worldwide and a financial burden of 100 billion, annual financial burden of 100 billion euros a year in uh, Europe. So recently with a lot of problems and after a long period we were able, the IRS was able to publish the new version of the white book which I think is a very important instrument in advocacy uh, towards the European community but also towards the national governments uh, in Europe and I'll show you some data of this white book. Um, this shows you an idea of the patterns of deaths and uh, disability adjusted life years worldwide. And so in the WHO European region, four respiratory diseases cause about 10% of all deaths. And these are lower respiratory tract infection, COPD, tuberculosis, and lung cancer. And these diseases cause about 70%, 7% sorry, of all disability adjusted life years. This shows you the pattern of mortality and cardiovascular disease remains the major sort of killer, basically the major cause of mortality. Respiratory deaths are responsible for 15% of the mortality. And the diseases that are responsible for the respiratory deaths are lung cancer, COPD and bronchiectasis, and pneumonia largely. Um, Besides this uh, impressive number of deaths, I mean, what is striking in Europe is that there's a huge uh, disparity, a huge inequality among the different countries in terms of the role, I mean, the, the patterns of mortality as you see here. You basically see that in the UK, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, age standardized rate per 100,000 is very high, like it is in Belgium. Denmark, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Hungary, and Romania. Whereas in other countries like, for instance, Sweden and Finland, uh, this uh, age uh, standardized rate is uh, considerably lower. These are the patterns of hospital admission by cause in the 28 uh, European countries now. And so cardiovascular disease is responsible for 13% of the hospital admissions, respiratory disease for 7%. Uh, and the diseases that cause these are primarily <coughs> COPD, pneumonia, acute lower respiratory tract infection, and lung cancer. And here again, these patterns are highly variable among the European countries with again very high admission rates in Belgium and the uh, Baltic Republics and then Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria. Whereas in other countries like uh, Norway and Sweden, these uh, um, 
uh, these patterns are completely different and our and respiratory admissions are less important there. And th this is coming from a large European study which is called the Isaac study and it shows you the prevalence of wheeze uh, of 13, 14 year olds uh, and more than 20% going from more than 20% to more than five to less than 5% and again you see that there's a huge disparity among the European countries in the pre uh, prevalence of respiratory symptoms as well. The cost of COPD is gigantic. This is an estimate made by the Harvard School of Public Health presented at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, showing the cost of illness of the major uh, NCDs, basically. And COPD has uh, one of the largest costs. Uh, it's presently 2.1 trillion US dollars. Uh, in, it was uh, 2.1 trillion dollars in uh, 2010, and it's expected to rise to 4.8 trillion in 2030, which will impose a huge burden on our healthcare systems uh, in the future. Now, how did these uh, mortality patterns uh, evolve over the last decades? Well, this, I think, is a very interesting paper uh, showing that um, over the last three, deca three decades, from 70 till the beginning of 2000, uh, the mortality due to heart disease, uh, which remains the, the major cause of mortality, but it's been reduced by 52%, and stroke by 63%, largely because of better prevention and better treatment. While at the same time, the mortality due to chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease has increased by 100%. So we seem to do, deal better with heart disease than with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and with respiratory disease in general. And I'll try to sh give you some ideas why that uh, might be. Uh, this is an American study looking at smokers. And what it basically shows is that the age-related uh, mortality of COPD in men and women has still increased also in the decade from 2000 to 2010, while the other diseases like heart disease and cancer have plateaued in that uh, period. This comes again from the European uh, White Book, uh, which basically shows the evolution of the respiratory disease mortality rates in the European countries where data are available. And what you can see is that it remained more or less constant in the decade between 2000 and 2010, which means that we haven't been able to reduce it uh, as, uh, here as well. And the same for the respiratory disease admission rates, where you see that they remain constant from 2000 to uh, 2010. So uh, the question then is, why did we make considerably more progress with stroke and cardiovascular disease than with uh, respiratory disease? And I mean, there's a multitude of factors that may be responsible for that, but I try to highlight two factors. The first is, I think, that there is not enough uh, funding for research in, for respiratory disease. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples of that. In the UK in 2002, 13% of all deaths were due to respiratory disease, while funding for uh, respiratory research only claimed 2.8% of the total MRC expenditure. And this is an analysis made by Jeff Laurent. The same is true uh, uh, for givings uh, from the public, basically, showing what was generated in 2009-2010 by Cancer Research UK, the British Heart Foundation and the British Lung Foundation. And you can see that lung disease seems to be much less attractive for the public. I'm not saying that heart disease and cancer doesn't deserve this money because they need it and they have made good use of it and made a lot of progress in the last decades. But I think it seems to be much more difficult to generate money for lung diseases. And the same, this comes from an analysis we made of the uh, European 7th fr Framework Program, uh, where you see that the total budget for uh, annual budget for the European Commission, or sorry, for FP7 budget for research was 54 billion euros. Uh, only 11% went to health research, and we made an alliance with cardiology, with diabetes, and a number of other associations to try to increase that. We feel that at least 20% of a research budget should go to health uh, uh, care research. And then if you look at how much of that budget of 6 billion goes to respiratory research, it's only 4.3%. And if you look at how much of that goes to the major diseases, which are COPD and asthma, it's only 0.5% of the budget. So again, uh, uh, there's not much uh, money spent in research for the, major, uh, res for the major respiratory diseases. 
And the second reason is, particularly in Europe, that's not the case in Canada, it's also not the case in Australia. But in Europe, the prevalence of risk factors, I mean, we haven't really been serious about the risk factors of chronic diseases. The prevalence of smoking, for instance, in Europe uh, is still very high, as you see. Most countries have a prevalence which ranges between 25 and 30 percent, and some countries are above 30 percent, and some countries even above 40 percent, which is a very high prevalence of smoking. I mean, I don't know exactly what it is in Canada, but I suspect between 10 and 15 percent. Yeah. In, in BC and Australia, it's uh, below 15 percent, and they have a contingency plan to get it below 10 percent. So these are really very, very high uh, prevalences. And I mean, we know what we need to do uh, to get the prevalence down, but I think the governments have great difficulty to make those decisions. So. And so the objectives of the program we had with ERS was first to increase lung health awareness, but I think we have achieved this and many politicians will tell us, well, we believe that respiratory disease should receive more attention. And then the question becomes, I mean, what are we going to do once lung health uh, uh, awareness has increased? I mean, we have to take advantage of this situation to do something. And so if we want to do something first, we need to identify the real issues. Then to, to define appropriate responses to these uh, real issues. And finally, to make sure that all responses are integrated in the existing action plans, because politicians are not stupid. Uh, they have action plans. I mean, they have, there's the Europe 2020 plan, for instance. There is national action plans. And so unless we succeed in getting all responses into their action plans, we'll never be successful. And that's what we did with the ERS. We made what is called the European <coughs> Respiratory Roadmap. It's a set of guidelines, recommendations, action plans that we recommend to politicians to sort of integrate in the national and the international action plans against respiratory disease. And there's a version for medical professionals and a version for health policymakers. And you can download it from the ERS website. I'm not going to read it to you, but I will give you some of the highlights of these action plans. There are uh, action plans on prevention, clinical medicine, research, and education. Prevention, uh, one of the first goals is to reduce inequalities between countries because there are large inequalities between countries, as you've seen. Uh, to reduce exposure of children to intrauterine and secondhand smoke because now there's more and more evidence that the chronic respiratory disease of adulthood and the serious and the advanced disease is basically related to exposure in childhood, which makes the children start with the pulmonary function that is clearly below normal to begin with. Reduce urban air pollution, improve indoor air quality, and manage the consequences of natural events. Uh, to give you one other idea about prevention, this is the map of Europe showing in green the countries ha who have smoke-free legislation and in red or various colors the countries who don't and you basically see that there's quite, still quite a few European countries not having uh, smoke-free legislation. One of the things that we would need to have in Europe that I believe you have in Canada, but I'm sure you, they have in Australia, is what is called plain packaging, which means that uh, all companies would need to use, all tobacco companies would need to use the same packs of cigarettes. They would need to make in what is called repulsive colors, that is usually dark brown, dark green, uh, in contrast with the attractive colors, which are pink, uh, light blue, and that sort of thing. And that is, uh, in Australia, proven to be very effective in reducing the uh, prevalence of smoking. And uh, they should also have uh, pictorial warnings of the diseases that you can get uh, of the, by, uh, by tobacco uh, smoking, uh, both at the front and in the back of the, of the pack, basically. And so there's a revised EU tobacco directive that unfortunately doesn't go quite as far. Uh, what is in the new uh, EU tobacco directive is that there's a ban on characterizing flavors, such as menthol cigarettes, for instance. There's also a ban on additive, which enhance toxicity and addictiveness. And there's now pictorial warnings and textual warnings combined covering 75% of the pack on the front and the back. It used to be only on the back. And so, I mean, if you saw the front in the tobacco shops, I mean, you couldn't see the pictorial warnings. For clinical medicine, uh, the cost of healthcare is going to be a major problem in the next decade. Uh, it's now around 10.5, 11% of GDP in most European countries. It's forecasted to become 16% of GDP by 2020. Uh, 
Uh, there will also be a shortage of health care uh, workers, uh, which is now primarily nurses, but it will become doctors primarily. In Europe, it's estimated to amount to about 1 million uh, medical professionals, which means that about 15% of the care will not be able, uh, will not be able to deliver 15% of the care anymore unless we adapt the way we uh, uh, deliver care. And finally, um, so that is mainly due to the uh, aging of the population that you see in this diagram uh, here. And I mean, one of the uh, um, if you, temptations for a government is say, well, we have high quality healthcare. I mean, I mean, if we don't have enough money anymore, why don't we reduce quality a bit? And that would be a mistake because I think it's clearly shown that quality is very effective in avoiding the catastrophic events that result from poor quality. And these are the events that cost a lot of money. So, I mean, if, you ha if you're short of money, your best bet is to have high quality health care because that is the cheapest uh, uh, approach. And so the recommendations we have on clinical medicine was that there is an EU action on rare diseases, which we believe is a very good uh, action. And a similar strategy for chronic diseases, including respiratory, should be introduced by the European Commission as part of the reflection process called for in the Council conclusions from 2010. There is a need to improve accessibility of care for those with chronic respiratory diseases. For instance, accessibility to chronic to respiratory rehabilitation programs is poor in Europe, but it's also poor in most countries around the world. There's a need to promote and better coordinate lung transplantation in Europe. I will show you why. And common chronic respiratory diseases such as asthma and COPD will need clear guidelines and registries set up at the EU level. This shows you the dynamic of the waiting transplant waiting list. The red bars show you the number of lung transplants performed every year. Uh, the uh, dark blue uh, uh, bars show you the heart, the heart and lung transplants. And then the blue zone and the orange zone show you the waiting list. And you can basically see that the waiting list is growing faster than the number of transplants, which means that we have more and more deaths on the transplant uh, waiting list. In terms of research, we believe that we are at the verge of really formidable breakthroughs. Things like boosting host event and innate immunity, which would be totally new approaches towards infectious diseases. Personalized care for lung cancer, for instance, is with tyrosine kinase inhibitors under certain circumstances very effective. Innovative approaches for restoring pulmonary function, which I'll show you in a minute. And I think the problem remains a better translation of research findings into clinical practice. For a long period of time, we have believed that if we would know more about the lung, I mean, that would automatically translate into better uh, treatments for lung diseases. That does not appear to be the case. So we need special programs for translational research. Uh, until the new molecules that are coming to the market now, in the past 40 years, there were only new, nine new molecules that, uh, against respiratory disease that were developed, and five of those for one disease, which was pulmonary <coughs> arterial hypertension. And so we believe that um, stronger public-private partnerships uh, would be useful for that, and also collaboration between industry and innovative academic centers because the industrial concerns now are too large to really be innovative. I mean, they, they sort of like lost their innovative capacity and they can sort of like restore it by co collaboration with academic, innovative academic centers. And an example of that is what is called the uh, IMI initiative, which is the Innovative Medicines Initiatives of the European Union, which is co-sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry and the European Union and which fosters uh, collaboration between industry and innovative academic centers. Examples of uh, uh, the breakthroughs is, I mean, the, what we could expect from stem cells, although there's some argument about this uh, studies, but I think uh, uh, it seems uh, very attractive at least. And also the fact that it is possible in animals at least to make new lungs, lungs that really behave like lungs that have PV curves like lungs. I mean, it's not yet possible to do that in patients. It will probably take a while. But these are the sort of uh, approaches that can really bring real innovation in the treatment of chronic lung diseases. 
Education, uh, I think the, the major challenges in Europe in terms of education is that we need to harmonize the education across Europe and the ERS has done quite a big effort to do that. And then one of the big challenges is uh, mobility of physicians but also mobility of patients. Uh, for instance, by 2015, more than 11% of the retired UK population will live abroad and that sort of uh, adds additional stresses to the healthcare systems in the countries. And it's not only UK population, but it's I think more mobility, there is more mobility now, uh, um, I mean, in all European countries. And finally, I think that patients will probably play a bigger role in the organization of healthcare than they presently do. Uh, they already play a role, but I think they probably will play a much uh, more important role in the decades to come. Uh, we talk about patient empowerment. Uh, what patients expect is that an adequate amount of information of adequate quality should be available to patients. That guidelines need to be inclusive and produced in collaboration with the relevant stakeholders, such as patients and their organizations. And what patients expect is that the practitioner is confident, competent, shows empathy, humanity and honesty, and he or she should be willing to view the patient as an important partner. And patients no longer see themselves as passive recipients of care. Interestingly, they expect to be involved in all decisions that affect them. And so in conclusion, I think we haven't really dealt appropriately with respiratory disease in the past decades. This is due to a variety of reasons. One is not enough investment in research on respiratory diseases, and the other one is that we need to combat the risk factors much more vigorously than we have done so far. And the European Respiratory Roadmap, which I showed you, and the ERS White Book offer specific recommendations to health policymakers in order to improve the outlook of these diseases in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> any questions for Dr. De Kramer? Uh, well, I don't think the mics are great. Anyway, thank you very much for a uh, long talk. Um, you showed us, essentially, in, in terms of public uh, investment in respiratory researches. Oh, there we go. It's almost zero. You know, <laughs> very, very scant. Um, how about, it's not zero, but I mean, it's yeah, much less than for other diseases. 0.5% or whatever it yeah. was. Um, how about uh, private investment in uh, respiratory research in Europe? <coughs> Relative to other common disorders, uh, are we doing better, worse, or about the same? I mean, there is not much private investment in research in Europe. I mean, maybe in the UK, but I think it's probably the only country. The, the problem is that tax rates are so high in Europe that there's no rich people anymore. So there's nobody who is able to sort of like give money to research. Uh, so that is not the big fraction of the research money we gather. I mean, uh, what we have is basically funds that come from the national granting institutions and from funds that come from the European community. Hey, uh, go, go ahead. Is there any government funding of smoking cessation programs in Europe? And what is the attitude there towards the use of the electronic cigarettes? Um, that's, uh, for the electronic cigarettes, I will refer you to the ERS website. There's a, lo a long sort of like uh, point of view of ERS on electronic cigarettes. Uh, the attitude towards smoking cessation programs is that there is reimbursement for smoking cessation programs in some countries. But what you really need to do to get the prevalence of smoking down is to take other measures than just reimburse smoking cessation programs. What you need to do is you need to increase the price of cigarettes and you need to do it with large steps, not with 5% or 1%, but with, let's say, 20 or 30 or 40%. That is effective in reducing the prevalence. And then, uh, I mean, do these things like plain packaging, pictorial warnings, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is the way you get the prevalence of smoking down. And the countries who have done so have shown that you can get the prevalence of smoking down. Tim? What other, what other opportunities for prevention is uh, Europe pursuing now? 
besides smoking cessation, you mean? Or, well, I mean, there's other things like, I mean, uh, uh, um, weight control, uh, uh, diet, I mean, uh, uh, activity promoting programs. There's quite a big, uh, an active program of uh, the European community on promoting activity, which is, I think, if you uh, take away the uh, effect of smoking as a risk factor, then what you're left with largely is obesity and inactivity as the main risk factors. And these are then the risk factors that you need to address. So. And that you're uh, also pursuing uh, very strict particulate matter regulations. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. what about in the workplace? Yeah, but that's, uh, that's uh, we, uh, ERS made, in fact, a whole set of recommendations on uh, reducing particulate matter uh, exposure also in the workplace. But if you, I mean, that's very important, but if you compare it to the effect of smoking, that is, I think, has, I mean, a very limited effect on mortality, but it has a significant effect on mortality. Uh, Peter? Um, by, by far the greatest risk factor for COPD is poverty. And that's only partly explained by smoking. Yeah. Um, it's likely that other factors such as poor diet are very important. And I, I wonder if more research shouldn't focus on that, the, the other factors linked to poverty, which also explains why there's no money, because rich people don't get COPD, yeah. so they don't leave their money when they die. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, an excellent, <laughs> it's, an, it's an excellent point, and as you know, uh, we DRS, we have organized a meeting in Tallinn on in a, social inequalities in healthcare, and I think in, in the UK there's very active research on this, uh, with Sir Michael Marmot, for instance, uh, and that's certainly a very important factor. And it's quite interesting to see that even in countries where there is universal health care, there is still large inequalities in health care, and they, they increase. They, ha they have increased the last decades, basically. Uh, the cancer foundations are very successful raising money. What percentage of that money is for lung cancer? I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. Uh, uh, um, but I, from practical experience, I, I wouldn't think that lung cancer is the most uh, attractive cancer, so to speak, uh, to attract money. Uh, I would say that most of the money, uh, and certainly givings from the public, go to, and, and rightfully so, maybe to cancer in children, which is, I think, something that raises a lot of money, uh, and a number of other diseases that affect uh, particularly young people. I, I can tell you, Stefan, that there's a graph that um, Mark showed with the Heart and Lung Foundation way down here. There's a similar one for cancer and breast, prostate, and lung cancer is at the very bottom. It's like, mm. like it's 20, 15, and 2 million, or sort of that's the sort of ratio. Mm. So it's a big problem. Mm. It's perceived to be a disease of smokers, but we know now that 20%, and I think there was a headline today that women in Canada have the highest mortality rate in the world for lung cancer. So something's wrong somewhere. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Go ahead. The incidence of asthma in the U.S. and Canada is increasing, mm -hmm. or appears to be. Uh, is that true also in Europe? No, I don't think that's true in Europe, but Peter knows that better. Uh, from practical experience, I would think that we have very relatively few admissions for asthma in Europe. Uh, and, and from what I see in the literature, I have the feeling that particularly in the US, uh, you have a lot more emergency room admissions for asthma than you do in Europe. But I don't do you know have whether... any explanation for that? I think it may have to do with compliance with, uh, with the treatment. Uh, um, I mean, the treatments in Europe on average are reimbursed, whereas in the US that is uh, only partially the case, basically. Any other questions, Professor de Kramer? Yes, one at the back, thank you. Some countries have been more effective in reducing smoking than others. Is that primarily culture or other factors involved? No, I think for, from my, I mean, what I believe is that is this is due to the policies that these countries have uh, 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 followed, basically. And Australia has had a very, uh, I mean, articulate policy against smoking and with goals uh, like, I mean, by then we want to reduce below 15%. By 2020, they want to reduce by 10%. So I think if you set the proper goals and take the proper measures, then you will reduce the prevalence of smoking. Any final questions? Thanks very much, uh, Mark. So uh, that was a wonderful... Uh,